Today on The Topping Show, Bud Light has their worst sales week yet. Biden fundraising off to a slow start. Colin Kaepernick says capitalism is bad while publishing a new book for sale. John Tapper slams Bud Light. Washington State passes California for the highest gas prices. Good humor killing an iconic ice cream novelty. Tesla wins the most American car manufacturer by Cars.com. And their new factory may be in India. FTC to sue Amazon over their prime. And Microsoft to decrease Xbox prices. All that and much more on The Topping Show. Thank you for taking the time to tune in today. Today's episode of Topping Show is sponsored by Topping Technologies. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, I see their founder released twice a day. Gotta say he's quite handsome and brilliant. He's me, that, that's a joke. If you're an IT leader or business owner and need a little assistance, you can reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Now, going on to the business part of the podcast, you have the FTC wanting to sue Amazon over their prime practice. Now, not to brag, but I believe I'm part of the 1% of Americans who do not have Amazon Prime, partially because I have this rare, unusual thing that only three, only a couple people have. It's called patience. And Amazon, they sell things you don't need. You're not going to die if you don't get your chips or salsa or what else they sell. Or your books next day delivered. So... I'm one of those folks where, no, I don't pay for it. And everyone keeps saying there's more and more value. You, you need Prime just, just for the streaming as well. And I'm like, well, that, does that make me smarter? No. Does it increase my business acumen? No. Does it help? But what, 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 what does it do? Entertainment. Oh, okay. Interesting. But I digress. Now, the FTC is suing Amazon because they're claiming that Amazon tricked millions of consumers into signing up for Amazon Prime and then frustrating their attempts to cancel because of the automatic renewing. Now, this in and of itself basically sounds like a standard subscription service in the regards that, yes, they're very sticky in terms of once people sign up for a service, the number of people actually cancel it or they decrease, they just stop the auto renewal is pretty slim. It's why everything in life these days is pushed as a subscription service because more often than not, they're not going to cancel because it takes effort. Now, I did have Prime back in the day when I was in college because they had some type of free college promo. And after a while, they did charge you. Once they found out that they were charging me, I subsequently canceled. But to say it's hard to cancel or hard to stop the auto renewal, that's ridiculous. It, in terms of customer service, and again, I don't own Amazon stock and I don't even know Jeff Bezos or Bezos. But... They have probably the best customer service when it comes to an e-commerce platform. You can reach someone within minutes. I remember one time I had an issue with something where it shipped to me, but I didn't get it. And I suspect it's because my apartment complex was so utterly inept when it comes to mail processing. And I didn't get the product. And within reaching out to their online person using the Amazon customer service portal or whatever they call it, they just sent me a new product and it took less than five minutes. That's exceptional customer service. That's basically the opposite of the United States Postal Service. Burn. Although, perhaps not that original since they've been utterly enough for decades. Well, thanks to lack of competition that's written in the law, you, they, they will be existing for quite some time. Fun fact, you can't actually mail someone a card or a letter through FedEx or UPS. It has to be through USPS. But I digress. Now, they're saying that they tricked them. They, they, it's hard to, hard to stop the all renewal. Now, that, I don't, I'm not buying that. It's pretty easy. Now, they further say that Amazon makes the checkout process harder than if you don't have, than if you don't first subscribe to Amazon Prime, which currently costs $139 a year, which, that's ridiculous. That's like one tank of gas in Washington State. That story later today. But, yeah, I don't see that. For me, that's way too much, but that's just me. But they're saying that the FTC is whining. I mean, stating that when an Amazon customer goes to the checkout, they have the different options where it's a little much cheaper and they're much faster if you just click the default, which I believe the default is Prime. Now, I order a couple of random things through Amazon. Traditionally, or interestingly enough, the thing they started off selling is where I usually buy my books because they have a pretty good selection. And if you want... I guess we can do a tour of my office here. I have whole shelves of books. But it's one of those things where, yeah, if you're 
if you're foolish or just moronic and you just click yes, yes, yes to everything, of course, they're going to auto sign you up for all that crap. That's usually how it works. Now, I think all it takes me is not even an extra second because it's habit. I just make sure I click on the option that says, yeah, I want the free shipping, but I don't want the ultra free shipping where it'll get here within two minutes if you have Amazon Prime because you need that book or whatever crap people buy on that site. I mean, very important things. You can't live without it. I know they sell groceries, but still, you don't need to have it. I digress. But it's one of those situations where it's clearly written. Like, if you can read, you know that you're paying for Prime if you select those options. So I don't, again, Amazon also probably has a whole army of pretty damn good lawyers. So I don't see them actually having to pay any fines for this. And in terms of the impact on the business, I don't think it's going to happen. Americans love Amazon Prime. They have a whole day dedicated to Prime. Although it is disgusting cultural appropriation. Many people do not remember the true meaning of Prime Day, which is when Optimus Prime gave his life for the Americans and for the human race on Transformers. Rest in peace, Optimus Prime. But I digress. Other interesting business news, you have Tesla winning the most American car, bar none. Now, this is a annual fun little evaluation done by cars.com, which is one of the three businesses still headquartered in Illinois for some reason. Now, they looked at, this is a combination. So the score on what's the most American, which is a little inaccurate because they don't take into account the number of places an Eagle could perch on the vehicle, number of places you could put a gun in the vehicle, or the number of books you put in the vehicle, or the number of sports balls you put in the vehicle. So the main metrics are already a little out of whack. But their specific metrics that they choose is a a little combination of the final assembly point, the number, or rather the percentage of United States and Canadian parts, which already, that's not really. But they also have the country of origin for specifically the engine and the transmission, basically being the backbone or the heart of the vehicle. And then they take into account the U.S. manufacturing workforce. Now, I'll read off the top 10, and it's quite entertaining. So you have number one, Tesla Model Y. Number two, most American car, Tesla Model 3. Number three, most American car, Tesla Model X. Number four, most American car, or SUV, Tesla Model S. The top four, they won. Let's keep going. Honda is number five with a passport. Number six is a Volkswagen ID4. Number seven is a Honda Odyssey. Number eight is Acura MDX. Number nine is is the Honda Ridgeline. Number 10 is the Acura RDX. Now, they get an F for marketing because MDX and RDX sound pretty darn familiar. Let's go to number 11. 11 is the Honda Accord. Number 12 is a Toyota Tundra. So, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, they don't even show up until the top. They're not in the top 15. GM's most American vehicle is the 19th out of this list of about, I think, 80 most American vehicles. And then you have Ford coming in at 38 with a Ford F-150 Lightning with the F-150, the regular one, coming in at number 66, most American vehicle. Now, I know, keep in mind, it's a global economy, and each year you have some of the components coming from different sources, different manufacturers. A couple years ago, Ford F-150, the base model, or rather the the model that actually lasts more than 36 months, the internal combustion engine model, that one was in the top, I believe, 10. So it does fluctuate from year to year, but I do think it's fascinating and interesting that the traditional big three which used to dominate the u.s economy i mean it was a reason detroit was the one most it was the richest city in america at one point crazy enough to think because of the big three the big three being the three largest automotive manufacturers with ford general motors as well as chrysler now subsequently chrysler went bankrupt sold out to european company now part of stellantis group but it is quite fascinating to see tesla continuing to revolutionize the automotive industry Although it also breaks my heart that I have three pedals, as every car should, referencing a manual transmission. And if you don't know what that is, you are missing out on the experience of a lifetime. It is so much fun, it's hard to get away from. In fact, I've only ever owned stick shifts. Not the most expensive vehicles, but I love my little Honda Civic SI with stick shift. Now, I digress. But other interesting business news, you have Tesla evaluating their another Gigafactory, and it's rumored that's going to be in India. Now... If you look at their global footprint, this makes perfect sense. India is one of the 
fastest and largest growing markets when it comes to end users. This coming off of the news that Apple recently started to ramp up their production in the country, partially because they get extra benefits in order to have actual Apple stores in the country. They actually just had their first official standalone Apple store, I believe four to five months ago in the country of India. And Tim Cook actually flew out there for a really great premiere, really good um, store opening and all that kind of stuff. Now, Tesla currently has factories in, in the United States, Mexico, China, Germany, Netherlands, and America Junior, also known as Canada, or Diet America, as some might say. So they have gigafactories all around the globe at the largest markets because, again, in a global economy, it makes lots more sense to manufacture it locally. I mean, just think of the cost of shipping and logistics alone. That's a lot of costs in terms of not just the fuel to put on the damn ship to go all the way across the globe, but also the time, delays your time to market, and you have to pay extra for all the logistics that could or could not happen. You also have to deal with tariffs depending on the countries and the politics that go into that. So it makes sense. And if I were a gambling man, I'd say it's probably going to happen soon. Elon actually built out a whole team to try to push an initiative for Tesla Gilgur Factory back in 2021. But it's one of those things where the politics get involved in the country and Tesla. Apparently the negotiations just kind of broke down as a lot of these companies and countries there's always looking for, you know, what's in it for me, probably the most important thing in sales, the WIFM, the what's in it for me. Or if you are more pessimistic on humanity, that's just what people are thinking all the time. So you always have to keep that in mind when you're doing negotiations, or proposals. But just given the overwhelming demand that's increasing for Teslas and the growing market in India, probably gonna be a good bet that will be, they'll be breaking ground, I would guess, pretty soon. Now, other sad businesses, you have Good Humor Killing, an iconic ice cream brand. Now, the company was originally founded in 1920. And again, uh, I know math, math, scores are, uh, math scores are at a whole all-time low, and yet teachers want more money. But because math scores are all-time low, I'll clarify, that's 103 years ago. Now, it is unfortunate, like many brands, they subsequently were sold to one large, large company called Unilever, which is the brand that ironically owns Dove Soap, which pretends all women are beautiful. While at the same time, they own Axe Body Spray, which lies to men because if you spray it, the women don't all run to you like in the commercials. But I digress, that's their new parent company. Now, they're discontinuing the specific ice cream bar called the Toasted Almond Ice Cream Bar, and that's been in production for 60 years. Now, Good Humor actually said that the reason they were taking off the market is because of sluggish sales, and it just wasn't moving as much as the price they used to do. If I were a gambling man, I'd probably say it was also a combination of cost. Almonds aren't necessarily a cheap item. They're, I think the last time I paid for the bag, it was about $12.83 for the big bag of almonds. And also, kids really don't eat almonds too much. I was an outlier back in my day when I had chocolate. I would have like the, um, the Hershey's almonds with dark chocolate. But most kids really aren't into that. And again, ice cream is really, it's a novel. The, the name is in the, in the product, it's a novelty. So I don't think a lot of kids are buying that ice cream. So it makes sense it probably to kill it, unfortunately. Now, going on to the culture part of the podcast, you have Bud Light having their worst sales week yet, which is fascinating because contrary to all the news outlets, which again, they all have their political affiliations, they lean left, one or two or half lean right, but they were all saying, yeah, it's, it's about to bottom out. It's fine to reinvest in that stock with InBev or Anheuser-Busch InBev, the big parent company behind the brand. Oh yeah, they're bottoming out. All, all the people who stopped buying Bud Light, there's not gonna be more people joining them. Wrong they were, wrong they were. More people are joining the bike boycott and specifically, this is since their boondoggle. No, that's not bad enough as a word. Business blunder, that's the best, that's our word. Since their business blunder of employing someone who again, their average user, the average fan of that person was 15 years old. And again, you can't sell them beer. Since that publicity stunt April 1st, which again was not a joke, but their stock is now a joke since they lost about 26 to $28 billion in valuation. Since April 1st, this is their worst sales week. So it's down. Week over week sales, 26.8%. Now this is for the week of sales ending June 10th. Given the production of the product and the distribution of the product, there's a little bit of a delay because you have, of course, 
you have the production, mate. You have the manufacturer, producer, distributor, then you have the end user, or you actually have the bar or the store, or grocery store, and then you have the end user. So there's a little bit of a delay just because there's so many steps in that process, which is why when we refer to a lot of these data points, it's usually a couple weeks behind. Now, there are other brands that are starting to decrease as well. The major brand, Budweiser, that brand is down 10% for that same week. Natty Light is down 2.3% and Michelob Ultra is down 2.4%. So folks are starting to realize, oh yeah, Anheuser Bush and Bev, they own 50, now 51 different brands of beer. And thankfully more people are starting to support mom and pop shops, independent breweries, and again, small businesses are back in the United States economy. They will appreciate your dollar much, much more than a company whose revenue is billions of dollars. But it is interesting to see, they had their worst week yet. And given the 4th of July, which some Americans still proudly celebrate, including myself, that's right around the corner. Those sales figures aren't going to go up. And these companies, that's like the Super Bowl. Well, I guess people would drink copious amounts of alcohol at that time as well. These holidays are huge for these brands. It's almost like in IT sales, Q4 or the fourth quarter of the fiscal year, that's when all of those brands make a lot of their revenue. So they subsequently give more discounts at that time. The peak time when people are consuming these alcoholic beverages they're going to other brands and the stock and the sales of the other companies are going up pretty much in the same proportion or a little bit more than what Bud Light or Anheuser Bush and Bev are decreasing. So contrary to what some of the news outlets are saying, I think this boycott is just gonna keep getting more and more intense as you have word of mouth, more and more people are talking about it, more and more people are starting to realize it. Even the folks who aren't dedicated on social media, they're starting to hear from their friends, their families, you know, you have that funny look at like a family get together where you look at someone and go, oh, what are you drinking and why? And then it sparks a whole conversation of the politics. Why did the company do this? What do you think about that? What do you think of the children? It leads to a large topic, which again, is not cohesive to a good time. Normally when you think of beverages and family get togethers, you want them to spark conversations about, you know, what's your family been doing? You know, how have you been? What's your favorite sports ball team? Not about politics. So it's not, sparking good cohesive conversations that make you want to buy the brand again it makes you want to avoid the brand specifically to avoid awkward conversations i mean some people are so introverted they just stay at home to avoid awkward conversations in and of itself so needless to say i think the boycott will continue to get worse and worse for anheuser bush and bev now other cultural news speaking of bud light you have john taffer also slamming bud light now, John Taffer is best known for being the reality TV star of the show called Bar Rescue, in which he goes to crappy bars, evaluates them. Basically, Gordon Ramsay, but for, for, for bars. He's very bombastic and quite entertaining for some folks. He is also usually stunned by the most crazy ineptitudes you see in a restaurant or a bar. And, of course, his whole thing is to give them advice and give them a little structure on how do you turn the bar around. Now, during a recent interview with Fox Business, John said, quote, Beer brands and people connection to their beer is an identifier of your personality. It's almost emotional. People connect with these brands very heavily and in their view, the brand slapped them in the face. This isn't going away anytime soon. It's forever, unquote. And I wholesomely agree with that statement. In my opinion, there are certain objects and certain things that People are very tribal about. It's part of their identity, which I find fascinating in and of itself. When I think of that, I think of football teams. People cheer for the sports ball team they were born at or they identify with, and it is part of who they are. They'll see, you'll see the sticker on every merchandise they have. And then you have trucks, another huge thing where I know people will buy the same brand truck just because their grandfather drove the same make and model. It's a huge part of who their identity. They're proud of that product. And I agree, a lot of people are very much identifying with their beer brands as interest. As odd as that sounds, it is a part of their personality. Although perhaps a lack of personality might be accurate as well, because again, it's a product. It's not your actions or your faith or it's not who you are. But I digress. John Taffer is 100% right or 110% right. People are identifying with their brand and that's why there's such a visceral backlash. You're, you're not seeing this type of boycott when it comes to other brands who have done controversial product endorsers or affiliate brand managers, whatever you call the brand ambassador. That's the fancy term they like to be called. 
you really didn't, this same influencer, or that's not a douchey word, the same person did a marketing campaign with Nike. You, do, you saw a little bit of backlash on the internet and some people attempting to boycott, but a lot of people don't identify like, I'm a Nike guy. No, no one really cares. I mean, if you're a Chevy guy, yeah, you're a Chevy guy. If you're a Ford guy, you're a, it's part of your thing. I'm a, some, no, oh, yeah, I can't, I can't even say what kind of beer I am because I actually don't drink beer. Although, interestingly enough, I bought my first case of Yangling, Yangling ever just to support the company because Oh, I also have people over for the podcast, so it's for the guest. But it's one of the oldest breweries in the United States. They did the right thing, stuck to their guns. And they're still family-owned, and I appreciate those things. But I digress. We'll see how many more people keep slam-dunking on Bud Light as they continue to crater into the ground. It's become a cultural phenomenon, and the, the entertainment is unlimited when it comes to the parodies and the videos. Which, again, from a PR perspective, that's, that's quite concerning for the parent company. Now, other interesting culture news, you have Colin Kaepernick saying capitalism is bad while he's quite wealthy and making money because of capitalism. Now, many people know him as a failed NBA quarterback who subsequently was fired because he did such a poor job, but he made infinitely more being an activist, which in the United States is a full-time job for many, many people and is surprisingly, thanks to capitalism, profitable. Now, he's worth a little over 40 million dollars again someone who couldn't play football and became an activist is worth 40 million dollars and he hates the country that's giving him 40 million dollars i can't keep driving that point home enough that's more money than most people see in a lifetime oh and not only does he have worth about 40 million dollars he has a house worth 5.4 million dollars in las vegas so he has a house worth $5.4 million. Now, when asked for a comment, or actually no, no one asked for his opinion. He just gives it all the time. I had to fix that grammar or that little faux pas right there. Now, last interview, he was saying that, quote unquote, black liberation, unquote, is not possible under capitalism. This is while he promotes his new book, which is coded, which is proud, he says proud, is very um, ambitious about the fact that it's coded by two famed Marxists. Now, I know history is not taught in any, in hardly any way, any time these days in public schools. We should probably be concerned why, but just think about that statement. Black liberation is not possible under capitalism. The United States, and if you look at who makes the most money in the United States, who makes the most money by, if you want to look by race demographics globally, the United States, African Americans earn the most per family household in the United States and any other country. Fact check me in that in the comment section. That's the last article I read a couple months back. But they make more here than anywhere else. Think of the most successful people in entertainment, foot, like foot, sports, entertainment, entrepreneurship. I mean, Oprah is worth a billion dollars. LeBron James is worth over a billion dollars for throwing a piece of leather into a hoop, which that's how you know I don't play basketball. I, I, I Threw a ball once when I was a, a youngster. That's that was the extent of my basketball career. Did did not go well. Actually, barely started. But there's more opportunity in the United States than any other country. If you look at who starts businesses in the United States, immigrants actually start businesses at a higher rate than people who are born here. The United States has more opportunity than any country on the planet. And yet he says it's not possible. Where if you literally just work like hell. I always tell people more, not 99% of what happens to you is determined by the person you see in the mirror every day. If you work like hell, you invest in yourself, you can make it. Look at the Brookings Institute. They've done the same study for years. They have consistently found that the number one way, I believe it's like 89% of the time, if you do these three things, you will stay out of poverty. One, get a high school diploma or GED. Two, do not have children out of wedlock. Wet, wedlock. And three, get a job. You don't have to be a Fortune CIO or CEO. Just get a job. If you do those three things, you will more uh, overwhelming majority of the time avoid poverty in the United States. And it blows my mind how many people still think, oh yeah, the U.S. is terrible. There's no opportunity here. Capitalism is bad. When capitalism is quite literally the mechanism which allows 
literally you it allows people to have literally everything you have in your life is thanks to the beauty of capitalism now some people might push back on crony capitalism which i think there are some concerns of course where the government chooses the winners and losers and they influence the private sector so that could be a critique but overall if you look at the total good capitalism has capitalism has lifted more people out of poverty than any other mechanism in history and all these all these morons i i can't think of an, a word or a term derogatory enough to describe people who are pushing communism my family escaped communism you don't see a single person moving back to cuba to try to start a business it doesn't happen because look at quite literally the government will it does not yours and from a cultural perspective it is fascinating to see someone who again hates the united states but again he's also publishing a book and his book is for sale which again he's offering a product and or a service for you to purchase if he was truly a communist he would just give it away for free but that's the most hilarious part of this is that he's selling a book for people to buy and i think none of this is a lot of these celebrities i think they just spew buzzwords to south park you see this sometimes in the business world and even it world where if someone just they, they think if they say enough buzzwords or keywords they'll sound smart and eloquent when really you just have to ask them like one or two questions to get through the bullshit so i always tell people if you don't know something be honest don't bs your way people are going to see through it and then they won't respect you there are many things i don't know anything about and quite subtle things i know a little bit about but i digress from a cultural perspective it is interesting to see united states society continue to reward people who don't like the united states and ironically enough reward them through capitalism and purchasing their products and their services Time shall tell to see if that's a long-standing theme in the United States. It's quite concerning. Hopefully, it'll shift back and people start to appreciate the opportunities that are here. And hopefully, they'll start to seize those opportunities as we all can. Now, going on to the political part podcast, you have Biden fundraising off to a slow start. Now, this is a little bit of anecdotal evidence recently. You have two people who sent out a bunch of invites for fundraising events in California this week. And they claim that they only received two single-digit responses. And one joke that the same two or three Democrats were emailing and calling the same list, guaranteeing low return, low return rate of what they saw. An email from one fundraiser informed recipients of a, quote, limited reduced price tickets for Biden's fundraiser. That event being in Ant Antherton, California, which that, yeah, that's concerning. You know, In terms of there are certain instances where discounts are very attractive and a very great sales mechanism. There's a reason there's a reason if you go to a store, everything has a sticker that says on sale, which yeah, no duh, you're a store, everything's for sale. And they say, Oh yeah, ten percent off, twenty percent off. There's a fascinating fascinating psychological phenomenon where everyone will always think something is under a certain price for price point if it ends in ninety nine cents. Like if it's a dollar ninety nine, everyone will think it is under two dollars. They will be convinced that even if they're educated, it, it, even if they're aware of it, it, it's fascinating that they still think it's under two dollars. When subsequently, there's always the tax, which is usually in Texas eight point two five percent, so it's going to be over two dollars because of the tax. But it is a psychological, like psychological phenomenon where that makes sense. Now, other instances, discounts really aren't necessary to drive sales, and they actually kind of look bad, in my opinion. Think of Apple products. Most Apple products are perceived as a very premium product. It's quite literally one of the most profitable companies on the planet. They make elegant, fancy computers and phones, which work quite well for many people. You don't see like a big sign like in the Apple store that says like 20% off. Like it sounds gimmicky. It sounds, it sounds day class A as Jim from the office might say. Old throwback of a reference. That was a basketball, but it's one of those things where you don't see that. And politics, it's usually the inverse. You're usually paying thousands of, thousands, of, thousands of dollars for like a plate dinner, which it's exactly what it sounds like. You're paying thousands of dollars for a chicken on a plate. It's You're doing it because the money is going to fundraising for that nominee, whether it be a president, vice president, whatever the job is. Actually, that, that, that were, that's, that's probably given too much um, respect to politicians to say they have a real job. A job implies you actually do things and get results. 
We'll think of a new term for that job or that professor. Eh, profession is still too nice. Needless to say, uh, I'm very pessimistic on people on the left and the right when it comes to people in politics. But I digress. On the plate, you know, they're paying for that access to meet that person and they're paying for them to have more campaigns for advertising, whether it be social media, print media. It's to bolster that person's view in the cultural lexicon and just get the name out there and advertise for them. To have to discount that, that again, that's... That's a little unusual in politics. I, I have not noticed that before. And it really isn't a boat of confidence. Now, Biden won't share his official, official fundraising numbers until the end of the quarter. But a person close to the campaign expressed, confident, expressed confidence about building a successful operation from the 2021 that raised $1 billion. And don't think people on the right don't do this. Every politician, every political party does this. But can you imagine raising a billion dollars to run for office and it's no wonder we always see so many commercials on every media matter whether it's a youtube or a tv or a cell it's you see political ads everywhere i always debate how effective they are kind of like car commercials Ooh, a car on a tv i really inspired to buy it i don't know how influential i don't know how influential they are but political ads are a huge booming business in and of itself so they raised a billion dollars for the 2020 election. And they're starting to see significant levels of new donors at the grassroots level, which they claim was a big help for them last year. So again, this is pretty early in the in terms of the campaign, try and raise funds. And the same article, many people have noted historically, Biden doesn't raise a lot of money himself. Now, that's not really that big of an issue because you have the the party behind you and that's a big value of why you choose a political party and unfortunately why more people don't run as independent which i'd like to see more of because of course more choices the better beauty of competition of capitalism you have more competition you have more incentive to do the right thing for your constituents and actually do better now in terms of choosing a political party the left or the right or republicans or democrats those are billion dollar institutions. So they have these war chests and these war funds. They all raise money for each other. And you see this with a lot of people on the left and the right. You'll have someone who's been in a district and successfully voted for decades. The public will overwhelmingly choose that person, but they still have to pick up the phone and raise money time and time again, because they're raising money for districts that are more purple or more competitive. And they want to put more money into that by putting more ads. Now, buying not raising a lot on his own, probably not that big of a deal because, again, he has the whole Democratic Party behind him and they're raising money on his behalf. Now, Trump has done a lot better in terms of this current runaround, well, also before in terms of raising money himself. He's quite bombastic in personality. He has a very entertaining and energetic personality. A lot of people are donating him specifically because he's being politically prosecuted. And it's hard to just, it's hard to not agree with that statement when he's the first person ever to be charged for this when again and he's also running for presidency which that's why hillary, that's the reason hillary clinton wasn't prosecuted partially because of the email debacle and having classified data they said that you know they're a presidential nominee it's not right to you know arrest your competition we're not a banana republic but in this case they're seen to be targeting trump for something that every again pence did it on the right biden did it on the left hillary did it I mean, it's hard to not, it's hard to disprove he's not being politically targeted. But that's why I think a lot of people are contributing contributing to, to his party more, or him more, for him being an individual fundraising mechanism in that regard. So will this have an outlook on the overall election? Mm, I don't think so. You have a lot of large businesses, you have a lot of large donors who are going, they're going to put money into the race no matter who's the for, front runner. And a lot of companies will just put money on both parties just because hedge your bets and that way you have favors on both sides so i don't think it's going to be a make or break moment in terms of the presidential race other interesting political news you have washington now the highest gas prices in the u.s which is quite saying something because they overthrew california now this is for a one week average and it was recently the one week average in washington was four dollars and 91 cents per gallon for that swill known as unleaded or basic unlimited. It's all about the premium. That's pinky high fancy, peak performance. But 
yeah, basically five dollars a gallon. Now, some might wonder, well, why are the prices going up? Is it because these oil companies are greedy, or is it because of taxes? Oh no, it's it's taxes and politics. So again, the umpteenth time, or perhaps a one thousand nine hundred nine, no, the nine billionth nine hundred ninety-five thousand million, the utmost example of again, when you put taxes on a company, they pass on the cost to the end user. Something that should be basic, but no politician seems to absorb or even care about. Now, these oil companies are choosing to pass on these new compliance fees, and those fees are adding up to about 50 cents per gallon, according to the Oil Price Information Service. And that was a couple of new initiatives passed in the state of Washington. Now, Washington experts say it, the price surge is linked to the state's largest, most ambitious efforts to battle climate change specifically a new carbon pricing program launched this year that charges businesses for greenhouse gases they emit. The first two quarterly auctions of emission allowances raked in more than $850 million. So again, they're just profiting off of this. And I mean, they, I mean the government. So you can still do this, but pay up. And again, in terms of the global footprint and the issue of climate change, which I think many people agree is a thing. I think a more eloquent debate or a more beneficial debate would be what's the climate change happening at a rate and what will have the greatest impact on it. And again, how are we going to fix it or how are we going to do? Humans are very good at adapting and creating new technologies. But when it comes to climate change, the U.S. The US could basically go to zero and it make very little of a difference because the greatest polluters of all these emissions are China and India. They're across the planet, and of course, they're not going to kneecap their economy or hurt the end users, like consumers, with frivolous and all, all these new regulations, laws, rules. And it's it's already an expensive state to live in Washington, so I can't imagine trying to make ends meet at 40-year high inflation, and you have yet another gas tax thrown on top of it, so you're paying $5 a gallon. That's, again, that's for regular unleaded. That's ridiculous. I'm very happy to live in a free state. I'll say that much. Now, going on to the business blunder of the day, you have Microsoft raising the prices on Xboxes. Now, this is specifically in regards to the Xbox Series X and the Xbox Game Pass. Now, the monthly subscription, the Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, that sounds fancy, it's Ultimate, it's better than Ultimate. Now, the Ultimate will go from $14.99 per month to $16.99 per month, and the base rental pass thingamajig will go from $9.99 per month to $10.99 per month, which again, in terms of marketing, F, because $9.99 sounds much more palatable as a consumable product than breaking the $10 mark. You see this with wine in particular. A lot of these categories, like I believe 97% of all wine sold in the United States, according to Kevin O'Leary, like this a couple of years ago, is under $9.99 per bottle. So an uh, overwhelming majority of the whole market is under a certain price point, and you're conditioned that that is an acceptable price point. And also just mentally, $9.99, it's, just, it's so much cheaper than $10. Now, I guess it's so much cheaper than $11, but breaking that digit, going from one digit $9.99 to two digit $10.99, when a lot of people are starting to tighten their belts, which is especially hard in America because obesity problem, but... They're trying to decrease the amount of money they're wasting every month. And again, video games are a luxury, not a need. They're going to probably see this on the credit card statement. Hopefully, they'll be like, do I really need to do that or pay for that monthly subscription? When you got 40-year high inflation, uncertainty in the job market. No, we do not need this. Let's cut this. Now, you also have the Xbox Series X console. They're going to be increasing their price to match Sony, which Sony makes the PlayStation. Fun business fact, the PlayStation 2 is the number one selling system in history by number of units sold. Now you can win a trivia tonight. You're welcome. Now, they're raising the price to, well, these are funny, funny different uh, currencies, Four, 479.99 pounds, 549.99 European Union credit things, and 649.99 Canadian beaver chips. 799.99 Australian widgets, all starting August 1st. The good news is that the Xbox Series S will not be adjusted to any markets, other markets, and they'll remain at $299.99 price point. 
Now, the business blunder goes to the fact for a few reasons. One, you had a competitive advantage against PlayStation and you're throwing it away to match them? And again, the purpose of a console, you do not make a profit on the console. That's been, in terms of value to the end user, it is a great value because there's more tech and more product and more materials in that, that in the product that you're actually getting than you're actually paying for. For this been quite some time, and the reason is once you buy that platform, you're locked in. You can only buy games for that system. So traditionally, a majority of the profits would come from the video games, which again, video games nowadays are basically, in terms of manufacturing process, they're basically free. You just, it used to be back in the day, you have chips and circuit boards for a cartridge system, such as on the best video game system ever, Nintendo 64. Nowadays, if you don't download it, it's just a disc, which a CD is just, and the machines just clap them out. It is fast, cheap manufacturing. You probably get under, I would venture 80 cents per unit when it comes to the cost of the plastic for the little flip case and the actual disc itself. That manufacturing is basically free. So there's a lot of profit in the games. And again, there are certain games that are exclusive to the console. In my opinion, one of the only reasons Xbox grew to such dominance in the video game market was because of the exclusivity of Halo, which for years is one of the most best, this is one of the best games. I remember the old LAN parties or local area network parties where you connect it with ethernet cables and yeah, I, I am aging myself, but I digress. To have this competitive advantage when it's cheaper than PlayStation, I know you're losing money on the product at that price point already, but why take that advantage away when we're at a point where people are starting to examine more and more of where their money is going and trying to get more and more of a return on investment or a better value? Granted, there's not a return on investment on a video game system. You're not making money unless you're a streamer getting paid. But I digress. People are starting to look at their pocketbooks and evaluate more, more scrutinize where their money is going. So to have such a competitive advantage price point when you're winning against PlayStation, which in terms of video game consoles, that's the main rivalry. Nintendo is one of the most famed legacy manufacturers when it comes to video games and entertainment in general, but it is, it's a different category. Microsoft, you have Microsoft and PlayStation with Sony. When it comes to Apple's Apple's comparison, they have, it's the most, it's the most accurate comparison. Nintendo is a little underpowered in terms of the actual processor and all that stuff. And, the games are different, it's a different feel. To have your most liked competitor and you're gonna give that, you're basically gonna get rid of the competitive fans you have. That's that's the business blunder of the day. Thank you everyone for taking the time to tune in. Can't thank you enough for taking time to like, subscribe, and comment. Each one of those things greatly helps out the channel. All your, all your feedback and critique also greatly appreciated. Also, don't forget to tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, heck, Tell your enemies, tell anyone and everyone to stay safe and fight the good fight.